Welcome to Paranormal UK Radio with your hosts, Irene Allen Block and Mark Johnson. Welcome to Paranormal UK Radio, the flagship show on the Paranormal UK Radio Network. I'm your host, Irene Allen Block, and and with me tonight is my co-host, Mark Johnson. Hello. How are you? Hello. I'm all right. How are you? Good. How's the snore bag? She's uh, disappeared at the moment. I think she's she's in there more than likely chewing up another dining room chair. She done one this afternoon, so I expect she's doing that. I don't know where she's gone. It's a bit uh, worrying, isn't it? <laughs> I know she's not asleep because I can't hear her snoring, so... I don't know where she is, Mark. Anyway, we've had sunshine here today. Uh oh, that's yeah, a rarity. Rare, isn't it? Yeah, in, uh, the UK and sunshine. Mm. There's yeah. that global warming well, in, for you. You know, Al Gore was right. Why? What did he say? <laughs> oh, nothing. He's just been like parroting for the last fifteen years about global warming. So you know, there it is. You got sunshine, global warming. There you go. Yeah, only in my part, I think, in the south of um, England and Wales, because a friend of mine contacted me earlier today and she said it was pouring and cold and windy where she was, and she's up in the, up in the middle somewhere. So typical British weather. Yeah, typical British weather, but, you know, uh, they reckon it's going to be warm again tomorrow, so I'm working on the suntan. Oh, get working on it then. you got to get prepared for Italy. I'm not going to talk about Italy tonight because everybody hears me every week going on about I'm off to Italy. So I thought I'd give everyone a break and not tell them that I'm just going across the water from Capri, down the road from Sorrento and up the, um, the road from Pompeii. I thought I wouldn't tell anyone because I didn't want to make you jealous. Mark. No, of course. You, you don't want to tell anybody or make me jealous the fact that you're going to be basking <laughs> in the sunshine, you know, going swimming, going down to the beaches of Amalfi, hitting all mm. the shops and the restaurants and having uh, vino in the uh, piazza. <laughs> no, no, you wouldn't want to make me jealous at all, would you? No, of course not. Okay, I, I didn't think so. Huh. I'll send you a photograph. Okay, yeah, send me a yeah. photo. That that'll be a good replacement. Uh, so anyway, uh, wanted what? to make an announcement before we get into the show. Uh, for those, oh yeah, local uh, local people in the state of Colorado where I am currently residing, we just announced a new meetup group in. Uh, uh, meeting event in Colorado Springs for August the 20th. We're going to be doing, uh, it's called Paranormal Highways, and we're going to be discussing a couple of past cases that we worked on. Uh, we actually made some documentaries on them, and uh, we're going to go in detail about these very haunted locations, play a lot of the evidence that we got there, discuss all types of what we think we're really dealing with there, because it's not so cut and dry. And uh, we're going to have a really good time with that. So uh, anyone in the uh, Denver, uh, Colorado Springs, Pueblo area, just mark your calendars for August 20th. And uh, and you can find more details uh, on the uh, SRI uh, Facebook page or on our personal pages. Which as well. is Super Supernatural Research Institute. Supernatural Research Institute, SRI. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we were Sari for a while, but we're trying to say the whole thing. Supernatural Analysis and Research Institute. It just went on forever. <laughs> Try, it did. It was not it's not easy explaining to people. So we shortened it. We went back to SRI cuz we were originally SRI, but SRI meant something different back then. The Spirit Rescue International. But now we're That's right. Supernatural Research Institute. Institute. Yes, I know. We're having an identity crisis here, folks. It's, <laughs> uh, it's typical when you're dealing with Irene and I. But you know what? We also want to invite people. We are going to be, uh, we're creating on Facebook. We're going to have a new fan page that we're going to be putting up for Paranormal UK Radio, specifically dedicated to this radio show. And uh, so please show us your support. Go out to Facebook and finds uh, uh, Paranormal 
UK Radio uh, fan page and like us. Now, and this, you can send this us. won't be a page, will it, Mark? It'll be a group. It'll be a group page where people can ask questions, during, you know, about certain shows. We might even take some. Uh, we might even do a question and answer show coming up here in the future, so we could take questions from people and answer them on the air. Uh, and we'd love to hear from everybody. We'd love to hear your feedback on the show what are we doing right what are we doing wrong and whatever we're doing wrong <laughs> we're, we're just going to ignore it anyway feedback yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah i just opened up a can of, of worms feedback. there so uh why don't we go ahead and um get on with our show who's our guest tonight Oh, tonight we've got Aaron Collins. Do you want to introduce him, Well, Mark? we have Aaron Collins with the Northwest Paranormal Investigative Team. Uh, Aaron, welcome to the program. Thank you. I appreciate that, Mark and Irene. Thanks for having me on. Oh, you're welcome. Sure thing. Thank Aaron. you for putting up with our inane babble for like the, the last uh, five <laughs> minutes. But... Oh, no. You guys are hilarious. <laughs> I'm enjoying oh, you it. Haven't, you haven't seen us when we start fighting. <laughs> oh, no. I got front row tickets. <laughs> <laughs> I always win. <laughs> I let her think she wins. I, anyway. I'm sure you do. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, yeah, she can kill me with her brain, so I have to behave myself. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, Aaron, um, for our listeners, can you just uh, tell everybody a little bit about yourself uh, and uh, how you got into the paranormal and how you uh, you formed your group? Uh, sure. <clears throat> uh, my fascination with the, well, uh, what led to my fascination with uh, paranormal and curiosity was uh, I had an experience when I was 10 years old um, and that led, uh, it actually scared the hell out of me, and I always was curious as to what I had seen, and I couldn't explain what I had seen, um, and then as I got older, uh, more and more paranormal things started to happen around me, um, and so uh, professionally, I was um, in the loss prevention um, field, so I took my, my skills that I had learned as a uh, loss prevention uh, investigator, uh, along with another guy that I worked with. He and I became friends, and we decided, well, we realized we both had the fascination with uh, and curiosity with the paranormal, and we thought, let's use the skills that, that we learned professionally as loss prevention detectives, so to speak, um, and put together our own team. It was very small at the time, um, and so we did. Um, he and I have s since split ways, but... Um, I continued on with the team, and uh, which is where we are today. I have a fantastic team. In fact, you guys interviewed uh, one of my teammates, uh, June Lundgren, who is absolutely amazing. Yes, um, yes, she's I remember. Very, very, very good friend. Yes. Yeah, she's a lovely lady. Absolutely she is. Lovely In fact, lady. she and her son, Ray, just uh, came back from England. Uh, they spent a couple of weeks uh, there on vacation. And so, in fact, we're meeting... Um, Wednesday morning, I get to hear all about her trip and see her mm -hmm. all of our great pictures that she took. So, um, but yeah, we have I, a really I, great... I, I was meant to meet her over here actually, but uh, problems in the family arose and I just couldn't do it. Oh, uh, mm. I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, I was a bit yeah unfortunately, about things that. come up. Yeah, so, yeah. but sadly, yeah. So, we definitely have a good team, um, a good, strong team. And, um, you know, we've also, I'm actually one of the planning uh, members of the Oregon Ghost Conference, uh, Rocky Smith, who is the director of the Oregon Ghost Conference. This will be our seventh year. Um, so I'm part of the planning committee. Um, I'm also the executive producer and host for a TV show um, called Paranormal Crossings. Um, which I started about uh, 2014. I used to do it on Blog Talk Radio um, with a uh, w another friend of mine who's a psychic medium, um, but she's gone on to do other things. And so my wife actually stepped in as co-host um, for the show. And so, plus I'm also a tour guide um, at uh, the Shang Portland Shanghai Tunnels, and so I'm uh, part of their paranormal team that they they handpick uh, Michael Jones who's the curator um, and founder of the Cascade Geographic Society which is a nonprofit 
and uh, their bottom line is preservation of history. And uh, they never set out to do tours, but 24 hours after digging the underground and sifting for artifacts and, and really trying to tell the history of the underground, people got word and wanted tours. And so they've been doing it for 25 years. And so um, I'm one of the people that they handpicked to be part of their paranormal team, which is called Project Ghost. So now I'm helping put together every year they do paranormal tours. And so I'm putting together along with them, um, the new paranormal tour for this season, which is in October. That's fantastic. Wow, you, he's a busy boy. Yeah, almost as busy as us. <laughs> yeah, very busy well, boy. Now, now the, uh, the, the Oregon uh, Paranormal Conference, uh, where is that going to be held? It was held um, for the first four years in uh, Oregon City, but we outgrew it tremendously. So... Uh, last year, um, uh, we actually held it in Seaside. And so that's where we're, our new home is in Seaside, Oregon and, uh, at the Seaside Convention Center, um, which it's absolutely amazing venue. Plus it's right there at, on the coast. And so it's just, it's beautiful. Lots of history there. Um, they do paranormal walks. Um, and, uh, we, ha we do bonfires with ghost stories, um, lots of speakers, lots of vendors, um, I teach classes there along with Rocky Smith. Uh, again, he's he's the the director and the founder of the Oregon Ghost Conference. Uh, lots of great people. It just a, a full weekend of fun and uh, lots of great stuff going on. What date is this again, Aaron? Um, last year was in April, and I believe this year we are just getting ready to get together to start planning for the next year, uh, mm -hmm. 2018. And I believe it's at the end of March. I don't have the exact dates yet. Uh, but I believe it's at the end of March of next year. Okay, people, watch out for that one. It's going to be good. Absolutely. Mm. Well, you mentioned mm -hmm. the um, the Shanghai tunnels. Uh, you know, that, I think that's one thing that, that a lot of people are very interested in is anything having to do with underground, whether it's in caverns, mines, or these tunnels. You have in, in the UK, in Scotland, you have the Edinburgh vaults you have the catacombs under paris and in um oregon you have the shanghai tunnels which uh i know ghost adventures was there a few years ago and they kind of really put it on the map for a lot of people and uh what right. got, what got you interested in in uh, exploring those tunnels and, and what have your experiences been like uh you know honestly the first time i i had always heard about the shanghai tunnels uh, I'm a transplant from Memphis, Tennessee, um, and so when I started the paranormal team, um, that was top of my list. Um, but really, it was ghost adventures uh, like everyone else. That's what really put it on the map, and I thought, oh my gosh, I have got to get down there. Um, but I never made a phone call. I, never, I had never taken a tour, um, but when I started Paranormal Crossings on television, um, I had to have Michael Jones as a guest. He is the one, one of the most caring, compassionate, um, just soft-hearted people, most humble person I've ever known. And when I asked him to be a guest on my show, he was more than willing to come on. He and I sat there with my, my co-host, and we interviewed him for an hour on television. But he stayed after for probably another hour, and we talked. We became fast friends. And... He had told me, he was a reoccurring guest over the last few years on my show. He's been on um, a couple of Halloween specials that I've had that the studio had asked me to put on. Um, and we just became fast friends. Well, he asked me to come and investigate the tunnels, which, you know, outwardly, I'm like, hmm, yeah, I think I could probably do that. And on the inside, I'm screaming for joy <laughs> because I didn't even have to ask. He asked me. Um, and so that was a dream come true, obviously. See, you handled um, it right. Quite, you always have to show your cool I, on the outside. It's like, oh, sh absolutely. sure, I think I can do that. <laughs> Inside you're going, yes! Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> well, and you got to understand, every paranormal team around the country and the world has contacted him because of Ghost Adventures and has wanted to come down and investigate. He will not let teams come and investigate anymore. 
Um, and th because of a bunch of problems, there, there's been all kinds of issues that have happened. And, and I, I'm not going to go into what's happened, but a lot of disrespect um, with uh, regarding artifacts and the, the list goes on. Yeah. However, um, he and I have gotten to know each other. Um, I have respect for people in life. I have respect for people in the afterlife. Um, and I treat people the way I want to be treated. So and that's how I am all the time. And so. And he knows that. So he and I, like I said, became friends. He, I earned his trust, and he asked me to. He he told me he wants me to come and investigate. So the requirement was is that I come and do a tour. So I went. I got my, you know, some of my family and friends. There was about twenty of us went down, and uh, did a tour, a private tour with him. And I was fascinated. I mean, I was hooked from the second we put our feet down into the Shanghai tunnels. I'm a huge history buff, and in order to be a paranormal, a good paranormal investigator, in my opinion, you have to understand the history first, and that's where I start. And it was amazing the whole time I was down there. Not only, and I don't know about you guys, but what I tell my team, and and also what I tell others, especially when I do classes, my biggest tool. In our biggest tool as a team, it's not the EMF detectors, it's not the digital recorders or the cameras or any of the other stuff. Those are great tools. I'm not knocking those at all because I use them. But our number it's one yourself. biggest tool, it's ourselves. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. It's our bodies. Trust yourself. And that's what I use mostly when I'm down there. And you, I'm telling you, the, the feelings that you get when you're down there, you can tell when someone's near you or something's near you. Um, and I felt it throughout the entire tunnels out of, okay, there was 18 of us. Um, it was not 20, but it, there was 18 of us out of 18 of us. And some of them were, were young teenagers, uh, friends of my, well, a couple of my, my, my kids were young teenagers at the time. And they had a couple of their friends come and out of 18, 14 of us <laughs> had paranormal experiences on that first night that we did that tour. And that's, you know, nothing, things don't happen on every single tour. And so for 14 of us out of 18 to have experiences is pretty incredible. There's a lot of energy down there, uh, a lot of things going on. And so after we did the tour, then he allowed my team and I to come down and do a full-on investigation. Then it took several years before I really had the time uh, to actually commit to uh, being a tour guide. And now I do it four or five nights a week. And I absolutely love it. I, I This is not a job to me. This is passion. I have passion for him. I have passion for the work he's done. Really, it's been his life work. And to be down in the tunnels telling the story um, that the people who were shanghai uh, the the prostitutes, the women who had been kidnapped and sold into prostitution and died in the tunnels, I'm trying to tell their story because they're not there to tell their story. And if we weren't down there telling this history, and all because of one man, which is Michael P. Jones. If it wasn't for him and his curiosity at a seven, as a seven-year-old boy for the first time, um, we wouldn't be down there telling the story. So I feel we're doing a lot of justice for these people uh, because that nobody would know this story otherwise. If you look it up on Wikipedia and some of the other things online, which really aggravates me, by the way, because they say it never happened, that it's a myth. Um, you know, some people I've heard are saying that we bought props to put down there. It aggravates me and angers me because none of these things were bought. These were all dug out, hand dug out by people and by Michael Jones and his teams. He was a professor. His his classrooms were not in the classroom. It was down in the tunnels. They had to crawl and dig everything out by hand with a shovel and a pail. Aaron, That's it. Uh, and there was no... Yeah, go ahead. Let, let's let's just, let's assume that there's a chunk of our audience out there who may not have heard of the Shanghai tunnels. You know, I, I know a lot of people have, but let's uh, let's go into. Could you tell a little bit of the history? What are the tunnels? What were they used for, and why are they sure. so infamous? Um, well, in the, in 1870, um, Portland was trying to make progress in the downtown area. Um, Captain John Hilton Cooch actually had claim on the north side of Portland, and he came from Boston. There was an old north end in Boston, so he found it appropriate to call that section of Portland the old north end. Um, and so that was more the seedy side. Well, 
they were trying to make progress in that sort in that side of Portland. So the problem was is the water that was running through the city was preventing uh, a lot of the progress. So they decided they needed to divert the water and they moved it to the underground. So they hired a company which hired Chinese workers because they were master tunnel builders. They were cheap labor, but more importantly, they were master tunnel builders. So they built tun tunnels underneath the city to divert the water so that they could build these beautiful buildings downtown Portland. That was the original plan. That was the original plan for the, the actual tunnels. But along with the good always comes bad, as you know. So then the Shanghai, because of the, the, the actual uh, gold rush, California gold rush, because of the gold rush, the, the ship captains had a problem because the men aboard their ships, they were jumping, jumping ship because they heard about the California gold rush. People were making money hand over foot back in, that, in those days, and they were left with ships and commodities to move, but hardly any crew. So the term Shanghai was born because they had no other choice at the time. And the term Shanghai was actually uh, brought up because they were the furthest port from Portland that ships would go to is Shanghai, China. So they adopted the name Shanghai and it didn't make it into the dictionary. It's uh, that part actually started in 1850. So it didn't make it into the dictionary until 21 years later, which is 1871. So the term Shanghai came in 18, or actually entered the dictionary in 1871. So now they had these men that were kidnapped. They were drugged with opium drops. They were dragged. They were put into holding cells, locked up seven days a week, 24 hours a day. Portland was different than any other city. Portland didn't wait for ship captains to come into port and put in an order, so to speak, for, for crew. Portland decided they're going to do things different. We're going to fill <laughs> orders before the ship captains ever come in. My day and job, was, oh, my day job I, I'm a recruiter, corporate recruiter. Uh, it's, that's called pipelining. <laughs> they, oh, they yeah. They were, they were, you know, they were increasing, they're working on their pipeline to have ready in case a job opened up. <laughs> Absolutely. Yep, you are correct. <laughs> so, so they would they did this differently, and and it was it was absolutely brutal for these men. They would pack them like sardines into these holding cells. These guys, half the time, they didn't know where they were. They they were they were transplants. They were vagrants, and most of the guys that were Shanghai, and they didn't know where they were, and they were thrown in these holding cells seven days a week, twenty four hours a day. A lot of them died. Um, and then if they did make it <clears throat> and they were sold aboard a ship, then the voyage was three to six years, three years for the voyage, six, uh, another three years to get back. And they weren't even from Portland, <laughs> but they would send them back to Portland if they even survived. It, it was brutal. And really, it was human abuse at its worst. Well, it's human trafficking, basically. It's it's Absolute. another it's another form of slavery, which you know, whenever yes. they talk about slavery in America, all anybody ever thinks of is the South with uh, African slavery. But there was so much different types of slavery that existed beyond the Civil War, and let's face it, it's still very prominent today with human trafficking, uh, with. Uh, kidnapping people and forcing them into prostitution or even slavery in a lot of groups uh, around the world. So, yeah, it's it, it, to think that that's, that happened in America. You could just walk into a tavern wanting to get a drink. Next thing you know, you wind up in a cell and then you're thrown on a ship for three years. And then when you're already on the ship, what can you do about it? Nothing. You're stuck there. Nothing. Exactly. Uh, it, yep. used to it used to happen here as well, Mark. They used to build tunnels from the ports through to the towns and the tunnels would link up with all the inns and taverns and when they when people were in there getting drunk or men were in there getting drunk what they would do was quite often they would drop a queen either depending on who was ruling at the time king or king or queen shilling into their um tankard mm -hmm. and that meant they were enlisted and then they used to just cast cart them off well i wow. wasn't wasn't in through the, the tunnels down to the docks didn't they also yep. have and, like trap and doors? And that was Shanghai in as well, because uh, the Shanghai, like you say, it comes from uh, that the majority of ships, either in the UK, America, and everything, especially that had these uh, um, 
sailors on that were, you know, kind of kidnapped or were the ships that always went to Shanghai. The, um, well, I was going to say, didn't, didn't these, uh, places in Portland, some of these uh, taverns also have trap doors? For- yeah, they they were called, uh, uh, deadfalls and on an average, they would have three deadfalls and they could actually have three victims standing at a deadfall at any given time. And their plan was originally to get everyone in the saloon drunk. That way, including witnesses. That way, when the deadfall was released and the, the victims fell through, um, nobody would even realize it because everybody was, was simply drunk. And on an average was three. But the most we ever heard is 12 in one location, 12, 12 of those deadfalls. That's a lot of people. <laughs> Good God. Yeah. I would it's imagine, brutal. you know, if I was one of those people and I suddenly had that, I'd be pissed. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know, what is, what is to keep somebody from committing, like, acts of violence against the people who have done this or even when they wind up on a ship? Uh, you know, part of the problem was once they were shanghai or um, harpooned is what they called it, if you were wandering around the underground, didn't know where you were going, and the Shanghaiers grabbed you, it was called being harpooned. Um, once they had you in their clutches and locked you up, you were not going to get loose. And one of the reasons why is because they would take off your boots or shoes, whatever you were wearing, and throw them in a pile. The reason being is because they littered the underground with blo- broken glass. And more importantly, they built boardwalks around the cells with a huge, thick carpet full of broken glass. So if you did kick your way out or make your way out of the cell, you wouldn't go very far because all they had to do was find you follow- by following the, bl- the blood trail. Then they beat you up and drag you back, and you'll start all over again. As far as getting out on a ship, you're basically worthless once you get out on a ship because you're on the middle of the sea. And really, the, the, the rest of the crew is going to outnumber you anyways, those that were being paid to be out there. Um, well, did, you know, these, it just, did these guys but, who were Shanghai, did they ever get any type of compensation for, for being on the oh, crew? No. So the, no, it, was, no. it was strictly safe slave labor. It was slaves, Absolutely. And there was one that actually, um, there were some that actually made it back to Portland and vouched to um, uh, get revenge. But, you know, you have to understand the guys that were the Shanghaiers, they were very good about pr- protecting themselves because they also walked around with bodyguards. They never walked around alone. Uh, they were smart and they protected themselves. So they, they were basically untouchable. Mm. So they knew it's a bit like the mafia, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, well, it's organized. Yeah. It yep. is organized crime. Yeah. I mean, yeah, absolutely. You know, everybody was paid. You know, and and when we're doing the tours, and there's this one section where we're actually standing in three cells. People are amazed that we're actually in three cells. It's pretty tiny. Well, they packed them like sardines, and people. You can hear the people upstairs because we're below. We're below what used to be a saloon. It's actually a bar still. Um, but back in those days, you know, they called them saloons, and People are thinking, well, I would just yell and scream and people will come down and hear me and rescue me. Well, yeah, you could do that, but the Shanghaiers outnumbered you and they'd come down and beat you up. Plus, nobody would hear you upstairs because everybody was paid not to. Yeah. So nobody heard a thing or saw a thing. And everybody, you know, everybody, else, is, everybody else is drunk and can't Pretty be much, in a position yes. to help you anyway. And I assume that if you were too troublesome that they would just whack you and throw you out in the drink somewhere because you were getting to be too much of a problem. Yeah, absolutely. Yep, so, that's exactly right. How many people do you think actually died down there in those tunnels? It's hard to say. I mean, there's, there's, I, I couldn't even guess, to be honest. You know, the, the trade was so, lasted so long. Um, it was from, it was from 1850 to 1941. So that's a lot of people, and on an average, about three thousand a year. Um, you know, it's hard to say how many people died. I just they were still make... doing it in 1941. I was just going to say that they yeah. were still doing this up till World War II. Wow. When World War II broke out, that's when it officially ended. Yes, yeah, a long time. How long? Are, how long are the tunnels, Aaron? 
Miles. I mean, the sections that we have access to is very small. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, it's not even a uh, not even a tiny chunk of how long the tunnels used to be. Um, they're still under a great portion of the uh, of downtown Portland. The problem is, is you know, everything that happens above ground impacts the underground. The business owners, the building owners, they're the ones that can that control the underground under that particular building. So we don't have access to that. It, it's hard to say, but it goes on for miles and miles and miles. Oh, I'm just flabbergasted at how how bad that was, and also the fact that I'm just stunned. I'm stunned. I'm stunned that it went up to 1941. Yeah, and and what he, what in America, what they did to people like this, and I'm sure Portland wasn't the only port that they did that in. I'm sure that happened oh, in no. almost all major ports. Uh, All up and down the West Coast um, is where this happened. And if you were Shanghai in, um, let's see, what is it, Port Townsend, Washington, um, that especially was pretty bad because when you went through a deadfall, a trap door, you didn't go, you didn't get dropped into a cell. You got dropped in, or you got dropped into the water. So there was waiting people waiting for waiting in a boat for you. You drop in the water and they pull you into the boat and you're off. You know, it was pretty bad. So it, it happened all up and down the West Coast. It's amazing. It's amazing. It makes me angry, too, because I'm a big uh, one of my uh, causes that I'm against is, of course, human trafficking, human slavery. Mm. Uh, you know, oh, yeah. and not only how big it is in like parts of Africa still going into the Middle East, uh, other parts of the world, you know, it's still happening and people are still being enslaved. Uh, and to yes. realize that this happened right here in the U.S. and was such a common practice, it just, quite frankly, makes me angry. So, uh, yeah, I understand. It's understandable. Now, the uh, these tunnels were in operation for almost 90 years from the sound of it. And yes. so many people, thousands of people were probably brought through there. Probably hundreds of people mm -hmm. died, if not more. So when did uh, they first start to excavate and look into these tunnels from a historical perspective i mean were they always known to be down there or were they rediscovered well they were always known to be down there but the whole shanghaiing you know the, the those type of practices and the white slavery and the prostitution you know people um you know like anything else they kind of swept it under the carpet so to speak um really michael jones his curios curiosity was when he was seven years old and in 1958, um, his foster brother's real father, Dewey Kirkpatrick, uh, was a very sick World War I and World War II veteran. He was being treated at the VA hospital in Bend, Oregon. And he didn't want to overstay his welcome um, with his family because um, he was being treated six months on, six months off. So he decided to stay in various hotels in downtown Portland. Well, Michael came down and stayed with them. And... He wasn't like his foster brother. His foster brother loved to be in the room at the hotels and jump on the bed and watch TV and order room service and all that good stuff. But Michael, he looked at every old person in the lobby as walking history books. So he would pretty much drive every old person out of the lobby with all of his questions, except for one guy that he nicknamed Captain Grump. <laughs> he said this guy, <laughs> he looked like a sea captain. You know, you had the sea captain hat, the sea captain face, uh, the sea captain pipe, curvy pipe in the in the coat. And he said, if you want to know about the history of Portland, then you need to go into the underground. Michael had never heard of the underground. He was seven years old. And he started telling him stories of you know, the prostitution and the Shanghai and all this horrible stuff. And Mike didn't, Michael didn't believe anything he was saying. So he said, fine, follow me. So he took him into the underground in a building up the street. Now, mind you, he's seven years old. This guy is a stranger and he follows him <laughs> down the street without telling anyone. And that was his first taste of the underground. Um, he was fascinated because he realized everything this old man told him was true. And that was his curiosity. Well, anyways, he came back to the hotel. Dewey Kirkpatrick was livid. He, after yelling at him for about an hour, he finally calmed down, realized what Michael had actually learned. So he made him a promise. He said, if you never leave this hotel or any hotel again 
with with uh, any stranger other than with me, I will do everything I can to help you learn about the underground and the city of Portland, the history. So he did. He made good on his promise, and uh, uh, that's where his start. That's where he started. So when he started <clears throat> teaching at Portland State University. Um, he had gained access to um, the underground and that's where he started to dig. And literally, like I said before, he had to crawl everywhere he went underground because everything that happens above ground impacts the underground. Every construct, everything that's construction wise above ground affects the underground. And so they crawled and they dug and they brought everything up to the surface to be sifted for artifacts and then documented and tagged and then the the artifacts were brought back down and they did this repeatedly and 24 hours after they started digging they started getting phone calls people asking for tours and of course that's not what the intent was he he was doing archaeological digs and trying to write this particular part of the history he heard the stories but he needed the proof and over time finally he said okay and started doing these small little tours well he realized the public's interest was huge and so then he met a guy in the mid 70s which uh, was an old street cop by the name of Al Zernato Al Zernato was actually involved in a bunch of opium den raids and things like that so through him he started learning more and more about what happened underground then he met a gentleman by the name of Melbourne uh, Kelly Gibson who went by the name of uh, Big Ears Kelly, which was his nickname. Now, this man was actually very helpful in writing, helping Michael write the history of the underground because he set him up with interviews with people that were Shanghai uh, families, of uh, people that were Shanghai. I mean, it was unbelievable what this man did for him, and and that's what what he did. He ended up going through over the next you know however many years writing this history. So the tours actually started about twenty, almost twenty six years ago. And so we're in our 20, 20, almost 26th year now doing these tours. Aaron, yes. over here, many of the tunnels that came from the docks and the ports was used for smuggling. You know, yes. they would bring the stuff through up into the taverns and the inns and things like that. Do you think any of that went on? Absolutely, they did. They did up until 1925 when... Uh, the city put up the seawall um, at the Willamette River, uh, yeah, in 1925. Yeah. And so once they did that, then it, that stopped that portion of it. Oh, okay. What happened with the women in those days, um, and, and and I'll bring it up to current, too, and, to, and let you know what we're doing as far as the awareness for the human trafficking today. Um, but back in those days, the women, they were kidnapped and they were sold into prostitution um, into other cities. Of course, they didn't kidnap them from Portland and then make them work as prostitutes here in Portland because these women had families and friends here, which it would, would have been easy for them to uh, be rescued here. So they sold them off into other cities, just like other cities did the same and sold them off here in Portland. Well, what they ended up doing was when Michael went down into the tunnels in the mid-70s with that old street cop, Al Zernato, Al Zernato pointed out um, one of the most uh, horrible things that I have seen in the tunnels, um, and that is a white slaver cell. Now, the white slavers were white men that kidnapped women of all nationalities and sold them into, into uh, prostitution. Now, the purpose of this particular cell, it's, it's no more than a small closet, basically, uh, made out of wood. The purpose of it is to lock the women in one at a time, and the purpose is to break her of her spirit. And through interviews and, and, uh, that Michael had done over the years, he found out that it would take 24 to 48 hours to break these women's spirits. Now, when Michael got a call in the, let's see, it was around 1980, he got a call from Big Ears Kelly. He actually found an old white slaver who was almost 90 years old, mind you, um, and he was willing to do an interview with Michael on one condition, that Michael didn't preach to him or yell, yell at him or put him down for what he had done because that was his job. Well, reluctantly, of course, you know, Michael agreed to do it because he really wanted to finish writing this part of that particular history. So he did. And when he talked to the guy, 
Now, mind you, this guy showed absolutely no remorse for what he had done to these women. Almost 90 years old, Michael said, I understand it took 24 to 48 hours to break these women's spirits. And he looked at him and kind of snarled and snickered and said, it didn't take 24, let alone 48 hours to break these women's spirit. And Michael said, what? How long did it take you? And he said, it only took me eight hours. And he said, what? Eight hours? Why? And he said, because I was that good at my job. You talk about sick. I, it would have taken everything in my power to hold back from just beating the crap out of the guy. I mean, 90 years old, showed no remorse for what he had done to these women. You're starting to see now this was all blood money. I mean, the, the women, the men, they were nothing but dollar signs. That, that's it. And it was just sick. It was sickening. So how did, I had, how did, sorry, Aaron, how did they break their sure. spirit? Did they beat them? They would uh, verbally and physically beat them inside the, these uh, white slaver cells and make them believe that they are owned, that they're not their own person. They're never going to see their family and friends again um, and that they own them, that these people own them. Uh, they were nothing more than a number, basically. And when they would leave that white slaver cell, they were not a person anymore. You know, they were a slave. And it was brutal. And they would reinforce these white slaver cells with, I don't know if you know what slab wood is, but slab wood is the first cut of a log. And they, it's very strong. So they would use the slab wood for all four corners of this, uh, this, this white slaver cell uh, to reinforce. So it's very tough. Plus, they would have wood on the inside and the outside um, so that they couldn't beat their way out. I mean, it, it was brutal. And it, I've had grown men on these tours, literally when they walk by, because I open the door for them to look inside. They can take pictures, that kind of thing. And I tell them that this is the second creepiest thing and most horrible thing you're going to see on this tour. I, I warn them before they see it, because I have seen grown men cry, literally yeah. cry as they walk by you know um being a father and a husband grandfather i mean you know it, it's it's tough on you emotionally um and so but i've seen them break down and it's very emotional it's not and i tell people in the beginning look this is not a fairy tale this is not a happy ending you know type of tour you know what you see is what you get this is history this is what happened here and so i i like to make them understand before they go on the tour this is this is it you know and so well, it's, it's heartbreaking, it's, isn't it? So, it? It is. It is. Mm. And now, Mark, also, we are human trafficking awareness advocates. And right. what we, we, we do is uh, we make people aware. At the end of every tour, we offer brochures for the public. And it gives all types of information on um, helping others um, who may be in a situation where they've, you might be in the middle of being human trafficked or whatever. Um, but it's, uh, we, we talk a little bit about it. Um, because we are advocates for human trafficking awareness, um, we have a museum which is located just right around the block from where the tunnels are. Um, and it's free admission, so anybody, you can get in um, free admission and see artifacts and talk to Michael Jones or, you know, we can give it part of the tour. But we've been targeted. People have thrown bricks through our windows. We're a nonprofit organization. And people have thrown bricks through our windows on numerous occasions, painted, you know, spray painted. They don't like us, obviously. The people that are doing the human trafficking, they know who we are. We yeah, did there, interview. There's still a lot of it goes on today, a hell of a lot. And there's a lot of it goes absolutely. on in this country. Oh, absolutely. Everywhere. Yeah. I, there's an article or a, a thing on the news about, um, it was in Texas. I don't know if you saw that article, but uh, that uh, semi-truck um, was in a Walmart parking lot and the driver went to go get some water, or asked for some water. And there was, I think eight people that were dead in the back of this trailer. It was a sex trafficking thing. And there was, it was, you know, it's over a hundred degrees down there. No air conditioning, no air for these poor people. You know, it's just sick, absolutely sick what these what these people do for money and but you know my 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 director for my former director for my show paranormal crossings um 
he and I set up an interview with Michael to do, he, he was doing an interview of a woman who was, she went through the, almost the entire process to be sex trafficked up to the point she was about ready to be sold. And luckily she was able to get away. Now she was 47 years old. You think of people being, you know, uh, late teens to um, mid twenties, maybe even early thirties, but she was 47 years old. And, it was a close set. I told I didn't tell anybody in the TV studio what what type of interview we were doing, um, and so it was just me and my director. Now at the time, my director was sixty nine years old, and he and I were in the control room doing the cameras and stuff. And then Michael Jones was doing the interview. We had to, you know, we had to uh, um, uh, shadow her face, and so we, you know, to prevent hide her identity. And for two and a half hours, we sat there sobbing. He and I were in the studio in the control room i had never heard anything so brutal one-on-one -on -one before you, we've all seen stuff on tv and and heard interviews and things like that but to be in the same room so to speak we we're we we're on the other side of the glass and i knew her because she was a volunteer at uh, the shanghai tunnels but to hear her tell her story i i like i said it was two of us sitting there sobbing for two and a half hours it was absolutely brutal I can't believe, I still have a hard time understanding why people do what they do. You know, it, it's, it's horrible. So the way I look at things is if we don't stand up for people that can't stand up for themselves, who's going to do it? I'm not saying us alone. I'm talking all of us, Mark, you, Irene, anybody who, who can stand up and bring awareness to the public so that we can, if we can save one person from going through this crap, um, then we're doing our job right, you know, and so and that's what we're about. It's not just about the Shanghai tours. It's not just about, you know, showing, you know, the, the history of what happened, but it's about the here and now, too, because it all ties in because it's still going on today. No, yeah, it's terrible. I was just going to say my sister, she worked in immigration and she was forever busting um, prostitute rings and most of them as well were the same, you know, they were um, white slavers for yeah. a while. Yeah. It's horrible. Yeah. Every day she was busting them. Well, most. Yeah, releasing those girls. Yeah. And a lot of those girls get thrown right back into it. Uh, you know? Well, yeah, I expect so. Yeah. Yeah. It's, 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 it's discouraging. <laughs> Um, well, a lot yeah. of them were illegal immigrants, you see. Hell of a lot of them were oh, illegal yeah. immigrants. And, uh, but it's all over the place, literally all over the place. But she was, a, you know, she'd go out four o'clock in the morning with uh, the assault team and straight away, you know, bust them. Wow. And the stories she used to come back with were heartbreaking. Oh, I bet. Mm. It's unbelievable. And, and they're, they're, they're clever, in, in my opinion, on how they how they appeal to these people or gather them or, or get them in, you know, it's not just running, you know, driving in a van, opening the side door and grabbing a person anymore. It's, it's, it's literally putting up signs for, you want to make a lot of money. You want to make $10,000 a month. You want to travel, you know, things like that. And so they use tech techniques like that or tactics like that to draw people in. And, um, I, I had, I encountered a guy, <clears throat> and I didn't realize at the time that he was in the middle of this sex trafficking thing. Um, but I owned a, uh, I used to own a, a cab out here in, uh, in where I live near where I live. And I had to pick this guy up at a hotel and I didn't realize what exactly he was in the middle of, but he was from Louisiana. This was 2008. And, uh, it, it wasn't until, uh, last weekend when I, when I was doing the tours, I sat down and read that, that, uh, brochure that we give out or offer the public for human trafficking awareness that I realized, you know what, that's what he was in the middle of. And I knew that he needed help. He was asking me for help. He came up here with this uh, group that promised all kinds of money. They were selling uh, magazines door to door. And he was actually from New Orleans. Um, this was around right after Katrina happened. And he lost his mother. He lost his sister. He lost his some aunts and and uh, cousins. 
And he was devastated. He had a daughter, a little baby daughter that he couldn't provide for because there was no work. And he answered this ad, you want to make a lot of money and blah, 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 and travel. And so anyways, long story short, the train that they came in on or the bus that he came in on, they lost his luggage and it didn't come until almost a week later. And these people or actually it came a couple of days after they came in, they would not send him to the, to the bus station to get his, his clothing. So he had been wearing the same clothes for a week Ew. and yeah, it was nasty. And the guy who was running this whole thing, very well dressed, um, had a wad of cash, he pulled out his, this cash to get, hand me 40 bucks to take this guy down to the bus station. Now, mind you, he was only paying me to take him one way. I don't know what he was thinking he was going to do to get back, but this guy needed to get back. So anyways, the story that he was telling me on the way, I mean, I believed him, obviously. And he said, you know, I don't know how I'm going to get back. He said, they promised me all kinds of things. They're only giving me 5 to $10 to eat on a day. That's it. And he said, I, I came to work with these people having no money whatsoever, and I'm not making anything. They're not paying me. They're making these women have sex with these all these other guys at that hotel that I'm staying in. I mean, he was shaking. He was crying. And anyways, I was, I'm an ordained minister. I was a, a minister for music for 10 years at my church. And this was kind of like at the highlight of, of my career with ministry at the time. And <clears throat> I called my pastor. I, here's what I did. I took him to the bus station. I said, listen, you get your luggage. I promise you, I'll wait for you. And he said, okay. And he said, you're not going to leave me? And I said, I promise you, I'm not going to leave you. Guy's never been to Portland. He doesn't know anybody here. He had no money. I said, I'm going to wait for you. I promise you. So while he was inside getting his luggage, I called my pastor and explained to him what was going on. My pastor said to bring him to him. He would take him out to lunch while I had to go and finish working. And then I would go get him after that. So we did. My pastor sat, talked to him, bought him lunch. Um, when he was done, he had some appointments to go to. I went and picked him up and I reluctantly, I had to go take him back to that hotel. I didn't have a choice at the time. I didn't know where else to take him. So <clears throat> I told him, I said, listen, here's my number. I have to take you to the hotel, but I'm going to make that guy pay me <laughs> for bringing you back to the hotel. And then I want you to call me if things get bad, then call me. Well, they got bad and I had, he was crying. And he, it was getting to the point where they were going to make him do some pretty horrible things for money for them, not for him. And it was definitely a sex trafficking ring. And so I had him sneak out, told him where to meet me. And I went and picked him up and I took a chance on faith and I had him come stay at my apartment and at the time, and he lived with me for a week. And I tell you what, it turned out to be the best week because he was so respectful and so thankful and grateful. I gave him money. And I'm not saying everybody should do this, so don't get me wrong, but I took a leap of faith. Um, after praying about it, I felt this is what I needed to do. And I tell you what, that young man, every single day, would get up before me, take a shower, fold all this stuff, put it back, and would leave the house every day and would walk the streets looking for a job. And Almost by the end of the week, he, he called me up and he said, I, are you at the apartment? He said, I got to talk to you. He came up and he said, here, he handed me, he tried to hand me a bunch of money. And I said, where did you get that? And he had a huge smile on his face and he said, I got a job. He said, I got a job doing construction. And he said, I want to pay you back for the money you gave me. And I wouldn't take it because I told him, I said, I didn't give this as a loan. I gave it to you because you, I wanted to. And ultimately... It turned out to be a great, great deal because not only did he get a job, but the guy that gave him the job also gave him free room, room and board and ended up uh, traveling to do this construction. It wasn't a sex ring, by the way, the whole traveling thing for the construction. Last I heard from him, he was in Utah making a lot of money, was able to send money back to his, his girlfriend and, and for his daughter to provide. So it turned out to be really good. You know, he was able to escape that life. But these guys are clever, and they do whatever it takes to try to reel these people in. I just feel bad for the others that were stuck there and couldn't get out. So it happens every day. We see those signs on the side of the road all the time. I don't know about uh, in the UK or in Colorado, but. Yeah. Well, Bob, 
you you knew it was going on in this hotel. You never you didn't think to go to the police about it. I or didn't. Would, they, realize uh, it. would it make no difference? You know, I really don't know. I didn't even think to go to the police at the time. Um, at the time, I just thought, you know, I can't prove what's going yeah. on. Um, I knew what I I knew just based on how his based on what he was telling me, based on what I was feeling from him. Um, but as far as proof, I I don't know. Yeah. It, it, honestly, I mean, it wasn't even a thought in my mind. I knew I had to help him, and that's what well, I felt God More, more needed. than likely, if they had raided the place, it would have ended up being squeaky clean. They would have been tipped off or something. This is oh, yeah. happens quite a lot. You know? Yeah, definitely. Aaron, my grandmother in Glasgow at the turn of the last century, uh, she was outside the shops. And uh, my grandfather, he was inside one of the shops. She was outside the shops and all of a sudden she was down on the floor. Whether she was, whether they'd done something to her or not, I don't know. But my grandfather came out just in time to catch two men shouting to people, leave her alone, she's drunk. Now, my grandmother never, ever touched drink in her life. She was teetotal. Oh, wow. Leave her alone, she's drunk. We know where she lives, we'll take her home. And my grandfather came out and he he went absolutely ape on these blokes, you know, because obviously his wife was being... But I remember him telling me the story and he said, Irene, he said they were white slave traders. Oh, my god. They were going to take your grandmother. Oh, that makes me sick. Yeah. Well, yeah. she's lucky that she got out. Oh, well, she's lucky my grandfather walked out the shop when he did. Yeah, really? Mm. My gosh. What year was that? Oh, that must have been early 1900, 19-something. You know, they were a young wow. couple then. They were a young couple. Sure. Um, my mother now is, she's ni she's 93 years old, and it was her mother. Oh, um, my goodness. Wow. Mm. Ugh, that's Maybe horrible. Maybe it was 18-something. Eight, I don't know. Uh, wow. Yeah, so well... And it's still happening. We're getting reports all day uh, coming in. Oh, well, Aaron, can you tell us something about the paranormal side of the Shanghai tunnels? Oh, my goodness. Um, yes. So, as I say, you know, or, or as I said before, I, I treat people in life as I treat people in the afterlife with respect. And when I get the tours set up, um, three of my kids actually volunteer uh, to help out as tour assistants. And so the tour assistant's job is to get the underground ready and set up. We have low lights to mimic what they would have had back in the Shanghai days. Uh, obviously, for um, uh, <laughs> fire reasons, we can't have torches anymore. Um, and uh, so we have low lights that we use to mimic, mimic that type of lighting. So we have to that have gives those. It, that gives it the atmosphere, yes. Exactly. Yes. Mm. So um, we do have some lanterns, low light lanterns and things, um, you know, electric candles, you know, uh, battery powered candles, t things like that. So there are some things we do need to set up. Well, um, when I go down there, I start talking to them and I say, you know, it's Aaron and so and so and so and so. And we're here to set up for the tours today. I hope everybody's OK. And um, just wanted you to know that we're setting up for the tours and if you'd like to make yourselves known, please do so. And uh, we'd love for you to talk to us and talk to people on the tour. You, you can touch people, but you cannot harm anybody and you cannot follow anyone home. So because I talk to them uh, throughout the time that I'm getting things set up, um, they're always messing with me. So what they'll do, one of the biggest things they do to me is they tap me on my hips. Uh, why they choose to do this, I don't know but they do this a lot. And uh, the other thing they do is they love to drain the batteries on my flashlight all the time. So I learned the hard way. I have to carry extra batteries in my pocket because during the tour, all of a sudden my battery will just drain completely. And mm. so quick, quickly change my battery out. Well, recently um, I was doing the part of the tour where I told you I was you know, there's a part where we actually stand in three holding cells and to kind of let them know what it was like for some of these guys. Um, I'll ask everyone to turn off their flashlights and any other type of life. They have their their cell phone lights on uh, flashlights on. I ask them to turn those off briefly. 
and I will turn a lantern that I have um, on. I'll turn that off and, and I'll be talking the entire time so that people aren't scared because people get kind of freaked out. And um, well, <clears throat> before I turned the lantern off, the lantern turned off by itself. And I told people, and I wasn't ready for it to go off yet. So I told the, the group, I said, that's okay. I have my flashlight. I turned my flashlight on and then my ba battery drained immediately. And so I started laughing and I explained to them that I do talk to the spirits and that's one of their ways of playing with me. And I said, I said out loud, okay, guys, I know you want to mess around with me and that's fine, but not right now because I'm doing this tour. Can you please turn the lights back on? Right on cue, I kid you not, the lantern turned back on. People started laughing. <laughs> then my flashlight turned back on. Then they turned back off. And they just kept doing that. Well, finally it stopped. Well, that's one of the things that they like to do. The other thing, <laughs> we, we see shadows all the time uh, down in the tunnels. Um, okay. They also like to make noise. So they will, um, there's some tools that uh, were found um, during the archaeological digs in this one particular section, and they're hanging you know, on the walls. And so they will actually kind of smack these tools, and it's loud. And uh, if you turn your flashlights on and look at it, you'll see them swaying back and forth. That happens quite a bit. Um, we do have uh, about 34, was it 34 um, wind chimes placed strategically throughout the tunnels. Now they're not within public's reach. You have to purposely go over to them and actually, to, in order to actually move them or make them sound. Um, but we don't have them in the wide open where everybody can just play with them. The reason being is because there's no airflow throughout the tunnels unless yeah. it's summertime and we, and we have some fans because it does get warm down there. But the, those actually go off from time to time. It's happened on my tours before. It's happened on the other tours with no explanation. Why are those going off, especially in the spots that they're in? Um, so a lot of things like that happen. We hear babies crying. We don't allow babies on the tours. Um, we've heard babies crying. The prostitutes in those days, they were allowed to have their babies. Um, and the women that would get pregnant, they were excited because they thought, oh, my gosh, so now I'm pregnant. Now some young young fellow will, will, will marry me and whisk me off and we'll live life happily ever after. Well, that never happened. They were allowed to have their babies, but their babies were immediately taken from them, left the women underground, and the babies were brought above ground, raised until they were old enough to be sold. And that's how life was. And then the women eventually died underground. And so it was a horrible life. So we hear babies crying. Uh, we hear women crying. We hear men crying and moaning. Um, I've heard that numerous times. Um, other people have heard it. People are touched all the time down, down in, the, in the tunnels. They turn around and nobody's behind them. Um, they hear whispers in their ears. Um, one, we had one volunteer. He was a Portland school teacher. And uh, he was in a particular section. And, well, he heard the whisper get out in his ear. And he did. He got out and he never came back. He decided, nope, I'm not doing this anymore. Um, another, another thing that people have heard is the word whispered in their, in their ear, stay. And huh? I don't know if you guys, but if I hear the word stay, <laughs> that's a little scarier than get out. Yeah, it know. is. <laughs> <laughs> I have yet to hear that one, but, mm -hmm. um, there's, there's so much activity that happens. I've gotten EVPs. Um, I'll go down there a lot of times, like I said, you know, to set up and I'll get there early and some of the kids and I will be down there and um, I, I will bring some digital recorders and I'll start doing EVP sessions, uh, electric voice phenomenon. And I, the most recent one I did, um, I was talking to the spirits in this one particular section and all of a sudden you can feel it kind of get heavy in there, like the room was crowded. I, I, I saw movement in the shadows, but I couldn't really see anyone, you know, face on, if you know what I mean. Uh, no, no solid figures. And I said, it's okay, go ahead and come on in, sit around us, sit in front of us. I said, um, and who's here with us? What is your name? And all of a sudden in the, in the recording, I can hear a male's voice and the tone was like, oh, 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 oh. You know, so he was saying something. I just couldn't make out what he was saying. So I need to run it through my software program so I can kind of clean it up to kind of decipher what he, hopefully I can, I can tell what he's saying. 
But yeah. we've heard uh, babies crying in the uh, EVPs. Um, is, did you hear sorry, with... sorry yeah, is, there an, is there anything bad down there? There has been. Um, unfortunately, there's another, I don't want to name the group, but there's another group that has um, access to another section, which is on the other side of our section. And yeah. they have brought people down and used Ouija boards and uh, mm -hmm. has, has done seances. Mm -hmm. And whatever they, whatever they have done, they have brought something pretty evil. And um, because of that, we've had June come down per Michael's request. And June has actually gotten rid of uh, some evil entities, um, which has been demonic um, on several occasions. And so I'm happy to say there's nothing down there now. Um, we don't feel any of that anymore since she's been down there and, and has done that. But we believe that other group is responsible for bringing it in. So we've done some things, or June has done some things to ensure that that's not happening, at least on our side. So oh, that's good. That's good. Yeah. In which I, really under, so. I completely understand why they don't like letting other groups in that do this kind of crap. Um, there's so many of these groups who don't know what they're doing. They've watched one yeah. too many television shows, and uh, or they yeah. think they they can go look at another group site and say, "Hey, well, that well, looks not, like fun." They're Let's not investigators, are they? They're thrill seekers. Well, yeah. If you exactly. bring in a Ouija board, and first and foremost, I I am not disparaging Ouija boards in general. They're like anything else. They're a tool. They can be misused. And as much as we've talked about, you know, Ghost Adventures went to the Shanghai Tunnels, you know, Ghost Adventures is my guilty pleasure show, but they have done so much <laughs> wrong in their career, especially the first few years, that, you know, yeah. they are not somebody that I would point to and say, do what these guys do at all in any way, shape or form, because they're not Ooh. researching. They're trying to, they're stirring things up and they've paid the price for it. But you don't go into oh a location God. like this and try to bring in negative or stir things up. You right. You have to respect the history, respect the people who not only are the living who have to still work there and be down there. You want to bring in a negative entity and cause other people to be in danger? Yeah. It's irresponsible. Yep. And exactly. You, you need to know what you're doing. And I've talked about this on my show um, when I was doing blog talk radio and you know you if you know what you're doing if you know how to close it properly then then that's one thing but if you're just going down there as a thrill seeker as as Irene said um, that that's different and if you don't know what you're doing you're letting you know it's like you, you not just letting good in but you're also letting anything can come through and if you don't know how to close that if you don't know what you're doing then you're letting God knows what in, and then we all have to pay for it, in a sense. Here, we're doing these tours, you know, we're doing tours seven days a week, and these poor innocent people coming through for these tours, God knows what's going to attach to them, you know. And so when I go down, I try, I pray, you know, obviously I still have my faith, and, and I pray, but there's things that, you know, in the past that these people have brought down there that obviously we had to have June come down and get rid of these things, and... You know, it's not right. It's not right that these people do these type of things. And now whether they're aware that they're doing something wrong, I don't know. I don't talk to them. Um, they're just a, on the other side of a wall, basically. And so it's anyways. But if you don't know what you're doing, don't do it. You know, Go, do it. Do, you know, learn. Well, was, learn yeah. first. Yeah. I was going to ask you, how do they section these, these tunnels off? How, how did they do it? And you just said a wall. So I presume that's yeah. it. <laughs> well, and their section is under a particular building, which is next door. Um, yeah. We have um, w our section is under uh, two separate buildings, and theirs is under a different building. But it's you know, if you can imagine basements um, under different buildings, they're all separated by walls. Um, but these are part of it is a stone wall, but the other part's a wooden wall. And uh, the fire marshal would not let us put a uh, a, a door with a lock on it. In fact, the Ghost Adventures um, episode that they did where they came down to the Shanghai Tunnels, there's one particular part where Aaron gets freaked out because there's a door that's um, uh, jiggling back and forth violently. 
Well, that's the door that separates our side from their side. Now, mind you, when they did the investigation, there was nobody on their side as well as our on our side. You know, it was a true lockdown, and there's no lock um, to go on that particular door because the fire marshal won't allow that. But I know that there is nobody on that side or our side. So whatever was shaking that door, we don't know. It was paranormal, but um, that's the door that separates the sides. So... And you're yes. right. And as far as um, the beginning of the show, yeah, they they made all the mistakes they could have made. Uh, but I will say that's also my guilty pleasure. And, you know, I've been watching them for years. I don't model myself after them or my investigations after them. But I do get a kick out of some of the 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 tools that they that they're using. Uh, Bill Chapel, who they, who their inventor that that invents a lot of the tools that they use. You know, I'm really fascinated by some of the devices that they, that he's come up with. Um, and so I enjoy watching that part. And Zach has changed quite a bit over the years, I must say. Um, I think with all the things that he has attached to him because of his years of provoking, I think uh, he's learned. So I agree with that. Um, I've seen them calm down. They don't provoke anymore. He sometimes is, gets demanding, but I think they've learned. Yeah. The the one thing, if I, if I want to, and not like, I want to spend time talking about ghost adventures, but what I, my one comment to them is like, guys, grow up and investigate. Stop being, oh my God, I'm so scared. It's like, suck it yeah. up, man up, or get into another profession. You know, unless, of course, they're doing it for, for the show because fear sells. But, you know, half the things that they're running away from, I'd be running towards. So, uh, right. It, it's, it's just like, I want to say, grow up hair. And investigate and quit screaming like little girls every time something right. happens. Oh, I understand. Well, now, well, having, you know, having said that, you know, have you encountered anything in your investigations or even while you're just down there that, you know, really has given you a start? Oh, yeah. Um, I, you know, even when the kids aren't with me, I still ha I still get there early to set up. And so... Um, there's been times where I've been down there by myself and you talk about Erie and, and <laughs> no cameras following you around, you know, um, you run to it. If something's happening, yeah, it, your heart will start pounding and you know, your, your first instinct is to go the other way. But as a paranormal investigator, you have that part in you where you want to go to it. You want to investigate. And that's what I end up doing. Um, and I'm not going to say that I'm not scared because I am, but I, I also want to find out what it is. I have seen shadows almost eight feet tall down in the tunnels. And you talk about scary when you're the only one down there and you're in a section where all this Shanghai had taken place, all this death had taken place. Um, you know, and you tell these stories day after day, you know, evening after evening, um, uh, of the horrible things that have happened, all these things are racing through your mind, and you're down there by yourself. Um, it, it starts to to get to you a little bit, but still, I want to go forward because I, not just not because I'm a, just a paranormal investigator, but just the inquisitive part. You know, I want to know what this is, and I try to make contact. Um, I don't need a camera to follow me around to do this stuff, you know, and. It's scary. It, it does get scary at times. I never feel threatened down there. I'm, I have to say, I, I always feel like I'm protected. Like I've been doing this long enough and I talk to them every time I go down there that I feel protected. You know, I, I, I wouldn't go so far as to say we're all friends, <laughs> you know, but I just I feel comfortable and I feel I feel protected down there. Um, but there are things that I have seen that I don't know if they're just passerbys. Um, but certain things that have scared me, there's a middle tunnel that separates one section from another section. And that middle tunnel is probably the worst for me. And that's where June has actually gotten rid of the evil stuff, uh, that has come through. Um, I think she had said that it's, uh, had been a portal and that's where a sprinkler system had been put in, in 1958. They literally put it on top of rubble and in, in when they put it in, we had to actually dig it out or Michael and the team, you know, before had to dig it out uh, or dig under it in order for us to get around in order to dig out the other side of the tunnels and obviously give tours. 
so we actually have to walk around this piping and that middle tunnel, a lot of people have issues with that. You know, they feel weird in there. Um, one lady asked me, she was an older lady and, um, what I always lead, you know, we all as tour guides, we lead the group. So when I come around that tunnel and wait on the other side for the, the group, I make sure everybody comes through. Okay. Um, you know, this, the footing is not, is not the greatest, you know, the floor is, there's a lot of dirt and dips and things like that. So I make sure everybody's safe and okay. And this one lady, she was older and she said, can I ask you a question? And I said, sure. She said, is it normal for, ha for people, for, uh, pebbles being thrown at people at the end of this tunnel. And I said, really? I said, did you have pebbles thrown at you? And she said, yeah, these small pebbles were being thrown at me when I got to the end of that tunnel, when I was turning around to come up towards you. Uh Oh, well, a bet children had... must've been down there. What? Who? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't hear what you said. Sorry, uh, go ahead. And Irene's muted, so she didn't hear me. I said, Yvette Fielding must be down there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, you know, this is something that I have heard of, but it's only I've only heard one story of that happening, and hers was the second. So, you know, things like that do happen, you know? And when we talk about, when we meet everyone for the orientation before we ever go down to the tunnels, you know, we tell the story about how we ended up doing these tours and things that happen. And uh, we tell them it's not Disneyland. We don't pay people to, to shut doors or open doors or uh, we don't put people down there in costumes or anything like that. But you may see somebody like that. Well, this is another thing that possibly happens from time to time. That's the second time I've ever heard of this happening. And so but that middle tunnel, let me tell you, that, that thing will give you the creeps. It, it does me every time. When I did my investigation with my team, we caught images of uh, glowing eyes at the end of this tunnel. And Michael Jones has done interviews. On, he's done so many different paranormal type of TV shows uh, featuring the Shanghai tunnels. And he talks about how people have seen dogs and cats and wolves uh, down in the tunnels, especially this middle tunnel. Well, we don't put dogs and cats and we certainly don't put wolves down in the Shanghai tunnels. But people have actually seen these things. And it's that middle tunnel that that's really kind of creepy. And so, yeah, these are some of the things that that have been seen and, and have happened to people since, you know, we've been giving tours down there. Dogs and cats living together. It's mayhem. Yep. Uh, In harmony. <laughs> is the middle tunnel, is that very large? Mm, it's just, no, not large. It's just length. And the thing that bothers people the most is the, the pipe that goes through. It's so large that, you know, you have to, it's not very comfortable to go around this piping. Um, and so it's just very awkward, very strange. And when you get to the end of it to turn around and come back up the other side, that's where you can kind of see where this other group, there's an opening where you can see where they have this seance table set up in that room and, this creepy furniture and stuff like that in there. It just gives you a weird vibe and a weird feeling once you get to the end there. So I think it has a lot to do with what they have done on that side. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I was, obviously. I was going to mention the one thing that you had mentioned earlier in the program that uh, I commend you for, that a lot of actually other groups out there would put us down for, is the fact that you're relying so much on your own intuition and your own body and senses to well, investigate. Well, that's what we do, Mark. Well, I know that, and that's why I'm commending him for that, because let's face it, yeah, so you. many groups out there will say, well, where's the scientific evidence? You know, where's the empirical data? You know, you get, you have <laughs> proof. You can't rely on personal experiences. God, how many times did Tap say that crap? Oh, gosh. And, and you know what? It's like baloney. Well, first of all, we're never going to, we, we don't have the tools to measure anything really paranormal. We can only measure what hap how it affects the environment. You know, that's just right. the way it is. And, you know, while getting an EVP or a mist on video is cool, it's still not 100% proof. Can't prove anything. It's just an anomaly. But, exactly. I, you know, Irene and I have been on the, um, on the bandwagon of, of really going off of what your intuition tells you because we all have these abilities. We're all able to pick things up and you got to go with that gut intuition and what you're dealing with there. You'll get so much information that you'll get to the heart of what is actually going on in a location. Oh yeah, definitely. 
you know, and, and that's what I tell people before they go on the tour. I tell them, be aware, be aware of your body. Let your body tell you what, you know, d depending on the environment, you know, let your body tell you what you're feeling and trust your body. And if you don't feel right about a certain spot, then don't go on that certain spot or say something. There's another spot down in the tunnels where um, paranormal investigators before me has actually pinpointed this spot to be the area that spirits like to draw energy. And, and I actually believe that because it's happened so many times on these tours where they will draw energy not just from you know, flashlights and cell phones and, and watches and other devices like that, but also from people. And I used to tell a story about how it happened to a, a gentleman that was on one of Michael's tours until it happened to a young lady on my tour. And I, I was telling everyone the story and I said, you know, if you feel like you're going to, like if you're feeling faint, you feel dizzy, you feel nauseous, say something to somebody in all seriousness, say something to the person next to you or who you, whoever you're with or interrupt me and say something to me because your safety is my first concern. And I will stop everything to make sure you're sure you are okay. And well, we moved on to the next section and boom, she passed out. I didn't even know it. It happened so fast. Um, I finished my, you know, my speech and then I was moving to another section when I, I was actually walking into the middle section, the middle tunnel, when everybody w was yelling, Aaron, Aaron, wait, come back. And so I did, I came back and she was flat on her back. And one of my kids, he's almost six one. He's a football player and um, her family was with her. And so I sent someone up to go call 911 because obviously my first you know, job is to make sure that everyone in that group is okay. I always carry an extra bottle of water with me, an open bottle of water. So there was a nurse who was tending to her that was on the tour. And so my, my, my son actually picked her up along with her family. They went with them and he carried her up above ground after they, they, I gave her the water or gave the nurse the water and we waited for a moment and then I got word that she was okay. Then I proceeded with the tour. Uh, but first and foremost, everybody's safety is my concern first. And, um, but it's true. It happens. It happens more often than people think, but spirits draw energy from people. It happens, you know, people snicker and they laugh about it until it happens to somebody on the tour or until it happens to them. Then they realize it's, it's true and it's no laughing matter. And but trust your your gut, trust your feelings. You know, if you feel that energy start drawing from you, you know, say something to somebody, do something, sit down. We have places all throughout the tour where people can sit down for that very reason. So it do, happens. Do you uh, have people try to practice some forms of protection, like either white light or or other types of protection to keep things from you know sucking energy? You mean people um, that come on the tours or people well, within our group? Within your group. Well, my paranormal group, yes. Mm -hmm. But as far as tours, I, I don't know. Okay. Now, I understand the average tour, you don't know. Yeah, so. yeah. Um, the, the one thing when you're dealing with down there, do you get the feeling sometimes you're dealing with I I know you'll you'll sometimes feel you're dealing with the human spirits of either the prostitutes or the the men who are Shanghai or maybe even some of the Shanghaiers themselves. Do you ever mm -hmm. at times run into things that you're having trouble explaining? Hmm. No, not really. I I do feel the Shanghaiers uh, as well as the people that were Shanghai and the prostitutes. Um, What's happened more recently to me has been uh, Shanghaiers. And what's happened is, and I started putting this in my orientation um, before the tours, is I make the, the men aware that um, they may <laughs> feel their shoes being untied. Um, and I told you in the beginning of the show that um, the, the Shanghaiers would untie the shoes of the victims and toss them in a pile outside the cells. Uh, away from the cells. So what started happening to me was I would give these start giving the tours in the beginning in this one particular section, and all of a sudden I'd feel my shoes being untied. I'd look down and my shoe would be untied, but nobody was down there untying them, or at least no one I could see. And it's really annoying when I'm giving a tour and I can feel my shoes being untied. Well, you'll be prepared. 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> They're going to take you. <laughs> exactly. And, and I'm standing in one of the three cells, you know, when that happened. And so yeah. I thought, oh, my goodness. So, <clears throat> uh, but it has started happening to other people. A friend of mine, he's more like a brother to me. He actually is, he used to be a logger. And the, the Shanghaiers would go after loggers, sheep herders, and cowboys. Those are the people that they would go after in these saloons because they were big guys. They worked with their hands. They were strong. So they knew they'd bring in some money, and they would work really well on these ships. Well, so this guy, um, he would <laughs> come down and volunteer to help out on these tours whenever he's in town. He's a truck driver. And he still wears boots, lace-up boots. Well, he, he knew about the stories. You know, I told him about the lace or the, the them t untying my shoes. So he said, well, I'm, I'm going to double lace my or double tie my shoes or my boots. And I said, all right, sure enough, that night they untied one of his double tied shoes or boots. He couldn't believe it. He didn't believe that it was going to happen, first of all, because he's a skeptic. Well, then down when we were in the tunnels, he's like, look at my boot. And I looked down and sure enough, it was untied. And he's not one to play a trick on me and, and just untie it himself. He was stunned. He couldn't believe it. And he's 6'3", 6'2", 6'3". Yeah, he, he was shocked. So, yep, it's crazy. Things do happen. The the other types of activity that you've gotten, when, when you mentioned you saw the eight-foot shadow, mm -hmm. um, do you think that was a human? You know, I don't think so. I, I did not feel, it's not that I feel felt threatened, I, but I did not feel comfortable when I saw that one. And I found out later, I wasn't, I'm not the only one that has seen him. Um, the, there's a uh, bartender upstairs. We start the tours under, er, in Hobos. Hobos is the name of the, the restaurant, um, uh, bar, bar restaurant um, that we start all this in. We have it, the orientation, the courtyard, and then we have access in the underground, but no, below, beneath this particular restaurant. And anyways, I was talking to this one bartender one night and I asked him, I said, have you ever had any paranormal experiences here? And he said twice. He had been working there for like 10 years. He's only had two experiences and both of them were involving this seven, eight foot tall shadow. This is after I had seen what I had seen. And I said, really, I was intrigued. So I said, well, what did you see? And he had, he had closed up for the night and he was waiting for his cab and he had all the lights off and he saw in a mirror, he, he looked in the mirror behind the bar and in the mirror, he could see behind him this seven, eight foot shadow man. And, but he saw a, a brim, a wide brimmed hat and a cloak type of thing. Now I didn't see that. I just saw the shadow of a person that was about eight feet tall. Um, I didn't see the details that he saw. But he remembers it like it was yesterday. And it scared him so bad he got up and ran and waited outside for his cab. Um, the second time he saw it was, and he felt threatened. He said, whatever it is, it's very evil. That's what he, those were his words. The second time he saw it coming down the stair ladder or the staircase in another part of the bar. And it was looking at him, like leaned his head sideways to look around this one portion of uh, the stairs to look straight at this bartender. And he said, I got chills up and down my spine. He said, because it was looking at me and he was nothing but evil. He has very bad intentions. So <clears throat> that's, I, I'm, I, I know that's the same thing I saw, but I didn't see the details that he saw. So okay, again, I didn't feel threatened, but I just, I did not get a good feeling from him. And I think it might be a passerby. I don't think it's something that resonate uh, re is a resident of there, but I think passes by or passes that area. The, the reason I asked is uh, because of, you know, our listeners who, who pay attention know that uh, I'm always into this. The reason I ask is because it seems like a lot of underground locations uh, tend to have activity that is not always related to human ghosts or spirits. There is mm -hmm. um, other types of entities that are being reported. Now, a lot of this that we've been looking into uh, with our group um, it deals a lot with mines and caves. But, you know, with the underground, it's it's under the ground, literally. 
And it makes me wonder if some of these other uh, reported type of phenomenon are being experienced down in these locations. Now, you did mention these other um, idiots coming in with the uh, Ouija board and they're trying to stir up the negative things. So maybe it's something that somebody uh, inadvertently conjured up or opened a portal right. and allowed in. Uh, but I'm just curious to see if now or in the future, if you run into some things that don't quite seem to fit into the model of what you're currently dealing with. Yeah, you know, the other thing is um, the building next door where I did see this particular entity. Um, they There's a new building owner and they're putting in a new business. This this particular building has been vacant for uh, since October of last year. And... So I'm curious to see what's going to happen now with the new building owners. Um, they have a business coming in. They're going to be doing construction here really soon, uh, above ground. Um, they are going to do they are going to do some construction below ground um, in the tunnels, but just a small section. I'm just curious to see what's going to be stirred up. So that should that should be interesting to see what what if anything is going to be heightened as far as uh, paranormal activity. True. True. So, and you know, a lot of construction does tend to stir things up. So it'd be interesting to see what oh, else yeah. happens. Now, um, absolutely. I, I know we've spent a lot of time talking about the uh, Shanghai vaults, but are there any other cases that you have been working on or have worked on uh, that have uh, proved to be very interesting? Well, interestingly enough, um, Cascade Geographic Society, um, they also have an abandoned camp. Uh, it was a miner's camp on Mount Hood, uh, and more specifically in Rhododendron. That's the name of the city. Um, and it was actually part of the original Barlow Trail. So this particular camp has three buildings that are original to that time from the mid-1800s. And uh, one is the original mess hall. Um, and then there's two other buildings. One's a house, and I can't remember what the other one originally was. But we were allowed to also, through Michael Jones, uh, we were allowed to do an investigation there as well. The road that separates this little miner's camp um, was actually the original Barlow Trail that Lewis and Clark came across. There's two graves that are um, unmarked. Well, they're unmarked because they didn't know the, the name of the people that, that passed. But um, there's two graves there. It's also close to an Indian bur uh, burial, um, uh, Native American burial ground, um, about less than a mile from there. A um, lot of Native American um, areas up on Mount Hood and, and in this general area. And so we were allowed to actually go up and do an investigation. And my goodness, there is so much paranormal activity um, up in that particular area alone just because of the ground let alone these buildings. And it was, you know, it's like going into a historical museum and doing an investigation. I mean, it was just incredible. Um, we, I've been so incredibly busy since we've done the investigation that I haven't even had time to go through everything, all the video and all the audio that we've done. But I know from personal experiences, we all had personal experiences. Um, and it was definitely very active. Um, and that's open to the public. I mean, not to do investigations, but it's open to the public. We have all kinds of activities going on all year round up on that village. Um, and so it's definitely accessible to everyone um, throughout the year for free of charge. Um, so anybody can go up there and check it out. It's the Living History Village. Um, and so anybody can go to the website and, f and find it and uh, go to some of the events that we have, especially throughout the summer. But you can actually go and see these buildings. They're amazing. So, Well, what was some of the activity that you were experiencing there? <clears throat> um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, voices. Um, lots of voices up there. There is a lot of um, – you can hear footsteps in these buildings, um, especially the mess hall. Um one of the things that uh, my son, my oldest son, um, he's part of the paranormal team, Zach, and um, he's an empath. So um, he's very, his senses are extremely heightened. So um, he sensed uh, so much stuff up there. He works really well with June 
And uh, I really felt it necessary to team him up with June because of that, especially on that investigation, because he's still learning, too. Um, um, but she's so great, you know, as far as working with him and others and helping them fine tune their gifts. And um, he felt so much up there and saw so much, um, which is I don't have that particular gift. Um, I, you know, I don't see what he sees or feels or feel exactly what he can feel. Um, mine, mine is a little different. I, I wouldn't even say I have that gift, but um, I could see shadows of so much. Uh, one particular area really kind of bothered me, and that was the kitchen area of the mess hall. Um, and I can't, ex I couldn't explain at the time, but then later when June came in and, and Zach came in, they're like, there's something not right in here. It was something I, there, I could smell. As soon as we walked in there, there was a pungent smell. I mean, I couldn't explain it other than that. There was this horrible smell and it, something didn't feel right. I knew I shouldn't go in there, but I did anyway. And just because that's my natural instinct, go where you're not supposed to go kind of thing um, and investigate. And um, it turned out to be a something negative, um, not demonic, but it was something I think June put it as minions, I think is what she called them. Um, and she ended up getting rid of them on the spot, but they were definitely evil. Um, they had no good intentions and I could feel that right off the bat. Um, and so, but as far as other things, I could definitely feel and hear people, um, walking around, um, so to speak, especially inside the mess hall, the mess hall seemed really active as well as the house it seemed really active to me. And so. A lot of activity up there. It, that whole mountain, you know, because of the Barlow Trail and lots of deaths that happen coming across. Plus, it's right near the highway, which is Highway 26, um, which will lead you to Mount Hood, the actual mountain. Um, there's so much that has happened in that particular area. Um, and plus, the Native American er in, um, burial grounds um, are near there as well. So it's just heightened with activity. Aaron. Can I ask you, what's the Barlow Trail? Is it something like the um, uh, Train of Tears? It's yeah, it's the it's the trail that um, Lewis and Clark came across um, when they ultimately ended up in Oregon, and mm -hmm. so and that was in eight to uh, gosh, I can't remember the exact date, but I think I want to say eighteen. Oh gosh, I don't know if you remember, Mark, but eighteen something mid eighteen hundreds. Lewis when and they Clark. Came across. Yeah, it was Lewis a lot. Yeah, it was very early. I thought like early 1800s. 18, yeah, you, you're 18, probably right. I can't. Twenties maybe. Remember. Yeah, it was. It was definitely early on. Um, but yeah, that's the original trail that they came across when they settled um, here. Okay, I'm not very good on American history. So who is this man? <laughs> For the English, <laughs> Lewis and Clark were explorers. They were um, they were tasked with trying to find a passage to the west uh, mm -hmm. to come from the you know to blaze the trail from the uh, eastern side of the continent and find a direct link through the river systems uh, to the Pacific. Uh, oh, which, it's not like the Trail of Tears. Then. No, 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 no. It, they were explorers. Uh, they yeah. had a, a native guide uh, interpreter, Sacagawea, who she traveled with them and uh, helped, you know, smooth over things with some of the Indian tribes that they met along the way. Was she uh, a big lady? I honestly don't know. Oh. I don't know if they had re any real pictures of her going, no. going back in that time. But, uh, okay. yeah, it, they they were the explorers that, that opened up that whole passage west for the uh, Europeans and Americans to travel out to the to the West Coast. Oh, I see. Yes. Okay, you so, can continue. So there's your there's your history <laughs> lesson for today. Sorry. There you go. <laughs> Any questions, Bueller? Bueller? Bueller, Bueller. <laughs> What's Bueller? Now, oh. We do have we do have a new section of the Shanghai tunnels that we're hoping to open by September, or at least by the end of September. You do. Um, we do. It's um, it's actually underneath uh, the building that our um, Shanghai Tunnels Museum is in, which, um, as I stated earlier, it's right around the corner from uh, the Shanghai Tunnels uh, that we give tours in now. It's on um, Cooch Street, 
And um, so basically, um, th- let's see, third in Cooch, in between second and third in Cooch in Portland. And <clears throat> this is a, a totally different uh, program because they had underground boxing. So there's a boxing area, um, illegal boxing at the time. Um, there's a missionaries area um, that's in the paranormal activity, you know, in that particular section is totally different. Um, I mean, I, I experienced it the first time I went down there. Um, my kids and I went down there to help get, you know, help get certain things set up and ready down there because a lot of work has been needed to be done, um, in order to get it ready for tours. And, um, you wouldn't believe the amount of work that has to be done. And so, you know, we rely a lot on volunteers, um, as well as others, you know, to come down and, and help with, you know, contractors and uh, electricians and things like that. You know, we got to make it safe for people to come down. And so it's taken a lot of time. Um, but we went down there and um, there's a, a missionary section. There's a crib room, uh, which is what uh, the women, uh, the prostitutes would have used. Um, there's so much down there. It's just crazy i saw a apparition of a man with a wide-brimmed hat now he wasn't eight feet tall he was you know kind of a uh, maybe six six feet tall something like that um i saw him when i was down there and i know one of the some entity um ended up uh turning off my digital recorder i had two of them set up down there one in the boxing ring area and then one by the missionaries area And I wanted to just, you know, let it roll while we were down there doing some work. And when I sent one of my kids to retrieve it, it had turned off after about four or five minutes after rolling. It had brand new batteries in it. There was no reason for it to have turned off. You had to physically turn it off. It's not easy just to turn it off. And so I can't explain that. Um, So that was crazy. But we all heard and felt and saw stuff down there. Uh, and our very first time going down there to help out. So, and it's under the Rich Hotel, what used to be called the Rich Hotel. And so it, it's exciting though. We're all excited. It's, this is the second, there's an opium den in the Shanghai tunnels that we give tours in now. This is the second opium den that you'll be able to see on tours in the new section. And we're excited for people to see this one as well, because this other one is the only one that people have ever been able to see here in Portland. So for them to be able to see another one is pretty, pretty cool. So we're excited about that. Oh, that's good. That's good. Is there any parts of the tunnel that haven't been excavated? I'm sure there are. Um, not that we have access to. Um, I'm sure there are tons of tunnels that haven't been excavated. You know, people, a lot of people don't care about history and they just, you know, a lot of developers, they just want to demolish them and put in a new building or uh, renovate a building and forget about what happened underneath and fill it with concrete. One of our biggest um, uh, problems is earthquake proofing a building because when they do that, they pour in concrete and put in steel and we lose the history forever. So yeah. that's been our, our biggest problem. That's a shame, but it has to be done, I suppose. Especially with new buildings, you know, they have to sink the footings and God knows what else. But, yeah, yeah, it's a shame. So, in this new part, is Mm -hmm. there any, there was no negative feeling at all in this new part where this new opium den is? No, I never felt anything negative. Um I'll tell you one funny story real quick. Um, when my kids and I went down there to help, I have four yeah. teenage boys at home, or my wife and I do, and um, two of them play football, you know, over six feet tall. And so they were doing a lot of the heavy lifting, and we had uh, a gambler's de- – there's a gambler parlor um, that that's down in that section. And so we were putting some tables, gambling tables, from that time um, down in that particular section. And – I asked Michael, I said, what are these rings? There's these metal rings that are hanging from the ceiling area uh, down there. And I said, what were these used for? And, uh, and straight faced, he looks at me and he says, well, these were actually used for hanging men. And this one particular part would actually jam up against their Adam's apple um, so that they, they couldn't move and they couldn't talk. And right at that moment, 
I'm thinking he's serious. And right at that moment, all of a sudden I hear, and so do some of the kids hear this, <laughs> like somebody choking. And I said, are you, are you kidding me? I said, did you just hear that? Michael didn't hear it, but some of the kids heard it and I heard it clearly. And Michael starts laughing. And I said, what's so funny? He said, I was just joking. So he, now he tells this story on some of the tours when people come into the museum because he starts talking about the the underground which is underground the new section which is under the museum and he talks about that story because he believes that was an end that was a, a ghost that was actually helping him joke with me <laughs> you know because he was only joking when he said that those rings were actually used to hold pipes they weren't used for hanging people but he was messing around with me and then here all of a sudden we hear what sounds like a man choking to death. And oh, I'm like, my, oh gosh. my gosh, are you serious? <laughs> so so they got a sense of humor then. Exactly. So I'm like, mm. great, Michael, thanks. <laughs> so I've walked in numerous times into the, t into the museum while he's telling this story about me laughing, you know. <laughs> and so anyway, the ghosts have a sense of humor, you know. Yeah. So. Oh, <laughs> But it's, it'll be interesting, though, you know, to to see this section completely done and ready for tours. It's exciting. And when do you think that will be done? Um, the goal originally was June, then it was July, and so now we're we're saying hopefully by the end of September. It's just been taking a lot longer than we expected. But like anything else with the tunnels, you know, Michael does things correctly. He doesn't rush through it. Um, you know, being being a history. A historian um, and working with archaeologists, you know, he does it right. And mm -hmm. plus getting all the work that needs to be done properly for the inspection from the fire marshals, you know, we don't want to leave anything, any stone unturned, so to speak. So mm -hmm. um, we're trying to get it all done right. So hopefully by the end of September. Okay. And in this section, have you found anything of interest or have you ever found a body down there, you know, like a skeleton or anything like that? You know, they haven't, not in this section, um, and not in the section that we've done, um, that we're currently doing the, um, the tours in now, but yeah. from what I understand, there have been in other sections in the city that they have found actually Chinese bones, uh, bones of Chinese workers, um, and other sections that we don't have access to, but just Michael has heard of this, um, none that we found now. In the section that we're in now that we're currently doing tours, in one yeah. particular area, we, we found out we're actually two floors up. That's how much has impacted the underground. And so I can only imagine what we're going to find when we do find access underneath us um, in that particular section, two floors below us. Um, that'll be amazing. Do, do you know hoping. something? Can I tell you something? Earlier sure. on, I was, attempt I was tempted to ask you, what was underneath the tunnel? Ah. What is it that's that, underneath that tunnel? I there don't know. There is something underneath the tunnel. And I was so tempted to ask you that. Well, well now you in did. in that one section. Yeah, you, you know, in the and one section. I thought section, to myself, that's oh, silly because it's a tunnel. <laughs> right? But you're right, though, because when they originally built the tunnels, like I said earlier, it, it was the intent was to divert the water. And so they decided to make it go underground by, by building these tunnels. The tunnels yeah. were actually designed, um, this beautiful stone work on the sides and archways of brick, but the floor was actually cobblestone. And you can't see the cobblestone anymore because of all the years of the, the water rushing through with all the dirt and the gunk and all that stuff. Um, and then the seawall being put in in 1925, you can imagine all that backwater coming up. So unfortunately, we don't see that anymore. But can you imagine all the years, all the all the impact or the the packed dirt and everything else? We're gonna find all kinds of crazy stuff. So hopefully, hopefully, we'll be able to find two floors down or be able to get uh, two floors beneath us. And and I'd love to be able to see just one one bit of that cobblestone and see what it looks like, because that dates back to 1850s. So I can't even yeah. imagine. Mm. Crazy. crazy. That is crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So, so. It's, what a, is that? Anything at all been found in that section, you know, belonging to 
the um, Shanghaiers or the people that were kidnapped? Um, yes, actually. Shoes or anything? Boots. There are. There is a section um, where I, I told you about the, the three cells. We actually are oh. standing in this one particular section where there's three cells. Um, Big Ears Kelly called Michael very excited. Uh, this is back in 1980. And he said that uh, he had had just gotten off the phone with a friend of his that he had known for 30 plus years. He and his friend were um, the guy he got off the phone with was uh, a logger. And so was his friend. And they both were Shanghai under that particular building. And they said that when they were Shanghai, the Shanghaiers actually took off their cork boots. Cork boots are the spike boots that the loggers wore and still wear today. That way they don't slip off the logs when they're running up and down the logs in the forest, especially here in the Northwest because it's so, so wet. Well, they took their boots off, the Shanghaiers did, and threw them outside the cell in a pile. And they believe that those boots are still there somewhere outside those, those original cells. So he and Michael went down there, started digging, and sure enough, they found them. So we actually have those boots that they found on display. The problem is we had to start – they built, put them in a wooden box, and we have to lock them up with a padlock because people started breaking into the underground after tours wanting to steal artifacts. So we have to lock everything up and if because if we lost those boots or any of the artifacts for that matter, we would lose a very important part of that particular history in that tour. And we can't we can't lose that stuff. It's sad that people would even do that. But anyways, people we, we definitely stop. have those boots. Here's a here's a public service announcement. People, stop being dicks. There you go. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> yes. <laughs> It's horrible. It, it, it's, it's like stop it already. I think we're yeah. we have to make up a paranormal smack squad just to go in and just you know somebody's acting up or doing something. Boom! Smack right upside the head. But there you go. I, okay, Mark. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I like the way you're thinking, Mark. Yeah. I would so uh, enjoy that. Heck, I'd enjoy yeah. that in my everyday life. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Up. Except I'd wind up in jail, I think. But, you know, anyway. <laughs> Aaron, was there any things of torture down there? Any evidence of torture? Oh, torture. No, um, as in torture devices, things well, like they that. Ob they obviously pun punish people that uh, rebelled against them. Sure. Um, you know, the one thing that the Shanghaiers used was... At the bottom of the deadfalls, which is the, the trap door that would, uh, you know, have them fall into, there was a mattress type of thing that they would fall onto. Um, and then there would be two Shanghaiers waiting for them at the bottom of the deadfall. What they would use is, a, a, it looks like a meat hook, which literally that's what it was. And they would use this meat hook to snag the back of their, their belt loop of their jeans or pants or whatever and drag them off to a holding cell. You, now you got to remember they were drunk and plus they were actually um, knocked out with uh, opium drops and it took <laughs> a lot of practice for them to get it right. So you can imagine, you know, them trying to do this fast and efficient because these doors were working on a counterweight system. So once these doors opened and were, were opened by the bartenders, mind you, um, they would have a buzzer behind the, the bar to let the people down below know how many people were coming. So if there was three that were coming down the deadfall, they would push that buzzer three times to let the Shanghaiers below know there was three guys coming. Well, each of them had a meat hook, which was a Shanghaiers hook is what they called it. And they would quickly use that hook to grab these guys, get them off that mattress and throw them in a holding cell. So it took practice. There's people that got hurt, <laughs> you know, and you can imagine that it, it, that was pretty bad for these guys. Plus the knockout drops alone. It took a lot of practice for them to figure out how much or how little knockout drops it took um, to, to use to knock these guys out. So, again, there was a lot of deaths you know, in, in these places. As far as torture, they beat the living snot out of these guys if they tried to get out or if they did make their way out and they followed the blood trail and, and knocked them back in the holding cell. So, yeah, those are the only um, physical things that we have found. Um, and you can see a couple of those 
Shanghai or hooks in the Shanghai Tunnels Museum that we have on display right now. Was the glass down there as well? Like you say, that they used to put glass down to um, stop them escaping. Oh, yeah. Did you find plenty yep. of glass? Oh, yeah, plenty of glass. And you can still see glass, funny enough. Yeah. I, I, and I'm not sure if it's because uh, the glass has just kind of seeped up through the through the dirt over the years and all the people walking and, and yeah. things like that. But um, you can still see glass on the floor um, in, in some, certain parts, which amazes me. So, and other people on the tours, they go, oh my gosh, there's glass. <laughs> you know, it's not like we break glass and throw it down there, but we have a lot of glass in the display cases that you can see as well. I think one of the most interesting items that I have seen on display, um, we have that hanging up in our museum, is a picture made out of some, to some type of bean or seeds or something like that. Michael actually found it underneath the dirt in the, the new section of the Shanghai Tunnels. And it survived. Years. And it survived. It's, well, yeah. it, only it only survived because it was under the dirt and mm. protected. Now, there was some damage done to it by rats. You can see in the edges. It's, it's in a frame now, but it was the edges were kind of chewed by rats. But it was he, Michael found it 17 years ago under the dirt, and he found out after he put it in a frame and hung it up in the museum that it's actually Korean. It's a Korean picture. And um, some people who are Korean actually came through the tour and said, oh, my gosh, that's a Korean picture. And they they told him a little bit about it. And um, it's very interesting to see this because it looks like like it was done yesterday. I mean, it was so well preserved. And, you know, we're talking it's very old probably mm. um, before the turn of the century. And so it's just amazing that things like that could have survived so well down there, yes. given the condition. Lucky it did. Yeah, oh, lucky it did. Is there, do you get many rats down there, or are you, do you take control of them? No, we've uh, no. I've only seen one <laughs> since I've been <laughs> doing this. <laughs> Dead, of course. Um, yeah. But yeah, they've they've got pretty good control of that stuff. So uh, yeah. I'm sure before it was a problem, but you know, not so much anymore. Yeah. Well, uh, we're actually uh, coming up on the end of the show here, Aaron. So uh, why don't you tell people where they can find you and tell us a little bit more about your your television show and where people can find that as well. Okay. Um, well, it's called Paranormal Crossings, and um, you can find it on YouTube uh, under Paranormal Crossings. Um, you can also Google me, Aaron Collins, C-O-L-L-I-N-S, um, or you can go to nwparanormal.net, which is my website, and you can learn more about um, the parano our paranormal team. Um, you can also find me on Facebook, same way, um, through uh, my Aaron Collins uh, paranormal page, or the uh, Facebook page, as well as Paranormal Crossings and NW Paranormal uh, Investigative Team page. Um, you can also learn more about the Oregon Ghost Conference, and um, you can learn more about the Shanghai Tunnels. I have a, a page on my uh, website for the Shanghai Tunnels if you're interested in a tour or interested in even being a volunteer if you're local. Um, you can find out more about how you can do that. And also for more information about human trafficking awareness, which we find very, very crucial and important to educate the public, um, go to our Cascade Geographic Society uh, website and learn more about how you can be a part of that and see what you can do to help uh, educate the public. Th fantastic and i want to thank you and all those that are involved with you in such a cause i think it's one of the more worthy causes that are out there right now in this modern age because so many people are not aware that it's still going on so uh kudos to thank you, you and um aaron thank you very much for coming fun. on the show yeah, well thank you nice. mark thank you eileen yeah, i really lovely appreciate to have you aaron it really was it's been great. You guys are awesome. Thank you so much. <laughs> we, we mess about a lot, don't we? Yeah. <laughs> well, you guys are great. <laughs> You're a lot of fun. Okay, then. Well, thank you for coming on. So well, Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for listening to another edition of the Paranormal UK Radio, the flagship show of the Paranormal UK Radio Network, heard every Wednesday night. 
10 p.m. to midnight Greenwich Mean Time and Eastern Time on the Paranormal UK Radio Network.com. Uh, you can listen to us live on TalkStream Live and TuneIn Radio. And then we're also on Monday nights. Uh, repeat on the Dark Matter Digital Network from 10 to midnight as well, Eastern Time. Uh, if you miss a podcast, you can always find our podcasts on Podbean, Stitcher, iTunes, and I know Irene's going to yell at me because I can forget the rest, but there's so many out there. Just just Google Paranormal UK Radio Podcasts. Uh, everyone have a great evening. Irene, we'll, we'll talk to you next time. Yep, lovely. Night-night, everybody. <laughs>